really nice to welcome my Trev Andrew here. Um, he's um, there's particular reasons why it's really great to have my Trev Andrew here um, talking about Bante, uh, our teacher Bante Sangharakshita, um, and the, yeah, some of those reasons that are. Well, we, we're talking about this evening about what it's like to have a teacher. Um, what is a teacher in the Buddhist tradition? Um, and Maitre Bandhu is a teacher. He's taught me. He's taught many, many, many of us here. Uh, he's taught, taught be- generations of Buddhists in, in a way. Uh, he lives here at the London Buddhist Centre. And he's taken, um, as well as teaching in, in this context, he's, he's been teaching not so much uh, actually at the London Buddhist Centre. He's been um, exploring further afield at, uh, with the Nature of Mind project uh, lately. But, but decades of teaching at the London Buddhist Centre um, also take an institutional responsibility, so he's ordained people. If you don't know what this means, you might well not know what that means. Hopefully some of the, these words will sort of become clearer, um, how, how we create a Buddhist community formally and in, informally. Um, so Maitreya Bandhu's done that uh, formally by ordaining people into the Tri Ratna Buddhist order, and uh, he's on the College of Public Preceptors, which is a... Um, a group of people who take a lot of responsibility for for Tri Ratna, our, our particular Buddhist Buddhist movement, and um, so there's levels of of Maitreya Bandhu uh, being a teacher and a a holder of of the lineage, and um, and he also knew Sangharachita. Sangharachita gave you your name. No, no, no. No, he didn't. No. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't give you your name. He gave my precept with his name. He gave okay. Name. Yeah, so you're... Okay, there we go. Um, assumptions there. <laughs> um, so, um, but you, you had a you had a personal relationship yeah, yeah. with Sankarajita yeah, yeah. and you're currently, as you mentioned in the first half, writing a long book-length poem about, about him. him. Yeah. yeah. Um, amongst other things. <laughs> Well, the poem can't be about one thing. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I wouldn't have thought. So, um, yeah, we, we talked, and there's a lot of things we want to try and convey that hopefully will be the sort of um, things that you might want to ask uh, about a teacher. Um, but f- first of all, I thought maybe you could just say about your personal relationship with Sangharajita, uh, how how you knew him and in what ways you knew him. I mean, when I, thank you, yes, when, when, I, um, when I, got, I got involved in 1985, I think, and um, Bante wasn't particularly teaching then. Um, he lived upstairs, he lived just in the little flat upstairs. And sometimes you'd sort of see him, he would, he would sort of lean over the railings and see whether it was safe to walk through the co- courtyard without anyone noticing him. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes you'd sort of see him, see, see. but I didn't. He didn't teach very much. He gave talks occasionally, but didn't teach. I, I was never personally taught by him. Um, um, the f- I we used to, in those days. We used to ask to meet Bante. I was only like twenty-five or something, but I thought well, I, I, I definitely want to meet this guy. You know, it was a disaster, absolute, <laughs> absolute disaster. Um, I was really nervous, uh, strangely nervous. Um, I mean, Bante, in a certain sense, had already had a huge effect on me. I. I'd, I'd come along to this um, to this centre on a Wednesday night. Um, I was at art school with Damien Hurst and people like that. Um, I'm the one that didn't succeed. Um, <laughs> anyway, I cycled here from my from my squat in Brixton on a Wednesday night to learn meditation. And um, I was I, as soon as I came here, I thought, I'm, "Oh, I'm a Buddhist. That's what I am." I didn't know that I was that, but I felt immediately I was a Buddhist. Um, I didn't know anything about Buddhism. But I felt immediately I was a Buddhist. And then I went on a weekend retreat, like two weeks later, something like that, which in those days, that's before we had our own retreat centre. So we had this little place that was... I remember the toilets being frozen, which wasn't a, wasn't a good start. Um, but I, we, one evening, we used to, and we don't do it anymore, but we used to just sit and listen to a taped, wheel, tape-to-tape thing of Bante giving a talk. And... Um, I'd never really heard, I don't think I'd read anything by him by then or had any thoughts about him, I didn't, hadn't seen him. And um, anyway, I, I sat and listened to this talk and this talk had an incredible effect on me. Um, looking back on it, it was, 
in, in Buddhism they talk about a direct transmission outside the sutras, no dependence on words and letters, and it was like that. It was like, it was quite uncanny experience. I've never had an experience quite like it, where I listened to something, and it was like the speaker not only knew what he was talking about, but seemed to know me even more deeply than I knew myself. It was really quite uncanny. Um, yeah, really quite uncanny. I felt transformed by this talk. Um, it was called Breaking Through to Buddhahood. Um, I can't remember any of the content. <laughs> As is so often, people say, thank you for your talk, and you say, which bit particularly? They never remember. <laughs> Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Um, I can't remember the content. But um, I, um, I was completely transfigured by this talk. So... Already he had changed my life. I mean, partly by coming here, you know, as I say, I cycled here. I, I don't think I would have been in, interested in a, a sort of a more traditional Buddhist tradition. I, I, I would have felt a bit too... I didn't, for then, it wouldn't have interested me. So I came here, then I heard that talk. So that was... And that talk had this very, very profound effect on me. Um, I... It felt like I was having someone explain to me what the nature of reality was. Um, it's always a strange feeling because then you go back through the text and you can't quite find the bit that you meant mm. but it felt like a revealing of things not, almost not like a talk at all but like somebody revealing how things really were um, in a certain sense my whole life is trying to live up to my experience of that talk so when I went to meet Bante I was already you know, very profoundly affected by him um, of course Bante didn't know me at all Anyway, I went, I went to this meeting with him. It was a nightmare. First of all, I went to... There was this, he had this very little flat, and you went into this little corridor. And I went to this little corridor, and he, he went to shake my... I went to shake his hand, and he went to shake my hand. And then I thought, no, no, you don't shake hands with a teacher. So I then dropped my hand. <laughs> he then dropped his hand. It was just a strange, like, in the middle of the corridor. Um, um, and then I went and sat in his lounge, and uh, we would talk. He didn't seem in the slightest bit interested. In fact, at one point, he took off his glasses to clean them and looked out the window. <laughs> I remember trying to talk to him about Blake, about whom I knew nothing whatsoever. <laughs> he seemed to know that. I, I remember thinking, actually, I really don't like this man. I almost crawled out of my hands and knees. So that was my first meeting with him, which wasn't a great success. Um, my, the, the, the moment that changed my personal relationship with Bantu, I've always had this very... You know, I've always strongly felt that I'm, ever since that talk, I've been a disciple of Bante's. I still am. I work. That's, that's what I am, prim primarily. But um, the thing that sort of changed our personal relationship, I used to see him, you'd see him on the stairwell and all that sort of thing. And sometimes, you know, I didn't almost, I remember once coming down the stairs, you know, using the railings and just coming down four at a time and nearly knocking them over. <laughs> but what changed it was when I was ordained, which was, in 1990, 1990, so I remember many years ago, it was the first time we were wearing blue robes, the robes that, you know, traditional robes. And, you know, they, you tied one around and you did this tie thing. And I didn't know how to do it. And I had this lovely handwritten note in my little pigeonhole saying, you know, Banty has heard that, in his handwriting, he, always, he often referred to himself in the third person, <laughs> Banty has heard that you are having worked out how to use your robe. If you would like him to come and show, to show you, he'd be happy to do so. <laughs> <laughs> very, very courteous. So I rushed in with these robes. And I, I think all... The, I, was, I was rather excited to wear robes. And that's not the idea of robes. They're supposed to be a going forth, not a dress-up party. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, I was fairly young. You know, I liked the idea of shaving my head and wearing robes and being spiritual. <laughs> um, but it was slightly in the spirit of a dress-up party. Anyway, I raced down um, to have... And I just forgot to be nervous of Bantwe. And um, he showed me how to, very courteously showed me how to tie the robes and so on. And I just said, oh, I've been trying... Slightly campily saying, oh, I've been trying to put them on. I didn't know how to put them on. He said, I, th it, I think they've worked it out in the last 2,500 years. <laughs> and I burst out into laughing, because it was a joke. And that laugh kind of broke my kind of in being in awe of him personally. And then I just started meeting him fairly regularly. Mm. You know, I'd, I'd always meet him when I could. Um, and he was always, um, they were always very good. Many years later, he said, of course, I don't remember that first meeting. <laughs> uh, he said, but I do remember the first time I saw you. 
He said, you are looking very forlorn. <laughs> <laughs> but look at you now. <laughs> so anyway, that's, what so anyway, that's a little kind of thing about my personal relationship. Mm-hmm. Mm. And um, I don't know, I think that's something significant about actually being able to relate to that, that laughter breaking. Yes, that all, yeah, yeah. That um, he probably suffered many, many nervous uh, people, yeah, yeah. including my first meeting with him. Yeah. I was so nervous I was late. Yeah. Um, Anyway, I mean, <laughs> what you don't realise is when you're very nervous, just give someone more work. Yeah. You know, you, he would have to then try and say, and you know, ask you questions. Just be more work. So I think one of the reasons he liked me to me is I, I would, I he, he used to tease me a lot, and I used to laugh at his jokes, and I would chatter on, and he mm. quite liked that, you know. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, we've been um, uh, leading up to this evening, we've been looking at uh, Bante's talk, some of Bante's talk, so each of the team has picked one of his many, uh, he had a lifetime of teaching and many talks were recorded, so each of the team members has um, picked a talk. Actually, I chose Breaking Through to Buddhahood, so some of, some people here might actually know the the content of the talk more than you. Um, (laughs) (laughs) It's not difficult. Well, why did I say that? Well, I mean, <laughs> one, one of the things that we were trying to convey is, is that, that breaking through to Buddhahood was uh, was given before uh, we'd walked on the moon, so it's a quite a mm. long time ago. So mm. what we were trying to say is these were given at a specific time to a specific group of people, mm. and they're still relevant. Mm. Um, and, and Bante died four years ago. Uh, he was an old man. It was time. It was time for him to die. So mm. our relationship is is changing. Um, so and you've given a little snapshot of your relationship. But what what does he? Why is he important for those of us who haven't met him? If that's a not too big a question. It's quite a big question. Yeah. <laughs> why is it? Why is he important for? Well, he may or may not be. Um, yeah. He is very, very important to me. I think he's important, if you haven't met him, by, by dint of the fact that this exists. Um, well, I suppose, that going back to my own sort of feelings, is in a certain sense, I can only say why I think he's important. But what I was interested in, if I was interested in anything, I was interested in what is this all about? What is life all about? What... What we hear, those, those sort of easily sort of cliched questions, what are we here for, what are we doing, is there a point to life? That, and they weren't abstract philosophical questions for me, they were questions arising out of quite a lot of unhappiness. Um, so I wasn't interested in Buddhism you see what I mean? um, yeah. as a subject. I didn't have the slightest interest in Buddhism. I sometimes even wonder now. Um, but I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm not. I wasn't interested in Buddhism. Why would I be? What I was interested in, in was anyone thinking and feeling and acting about these great matters. Why am I here? What's it for? Why do I get myself into such a state? Is there a goal? Is does life have any meaning? For instance, I never believed in God. Um, I remember trying to, but I never believed in God. Um, but I also seemed to think that his absence, as it were, was a massive matter. You know, um, so I think what Bante's done, um, well, what he's done for me is talk to me. Mm. You know, um, that's what you want from a teacher, not someone who gives you lots of information and technical things. They could be valuable, but only secondary. So, you want someone who talks to you. And who addresses the real issues of your life, and and helps you um, understand them more deeply, and helps you do something about them, and especially, I think, gives you a vision of life, but a, a vision of life that's um, transcendent, really, in, particularly in the figure of the Buddha, um, but not um, not a kind of um, not something Buddhist in a, in a certain sense. I, I don't mean that in a jor- I just mean not something um, that's like an ism, like an ist, you know, like Buddhism. Um, not, not, in other words, not a theory, not an ideology, uh, but a way of life, a vision for life, a response to life. And I found all of those things in Bantu very, very strongly, a response to life, a real 
understanding of the, the terrible suffering of life, you know, without being morbid about that or, or whatever. You know, you know, Bantic could also be extremely charming and very funny. But um, somebody who could, who could look at life properly and deeply and respond to it, somebody who could then, uh, for me, then help me understand that and really centrally give me a path and a vision of practice, you know, um, which I could practice in my life. I was at art school. I wasn't going to become a monk or... I did have a brief idea that I might do, but it was very brief. Um, the word celibacy put me off, um, <laughs> as it so often does. Um, but, you know, I, want, I needed a life that I could... I needed, a, a, I needed someone to take me sort of seriously in the right way. And I needed someone to give me a, a vision of what life could be. And I needed someone to give me a, a, a path to that vision. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's what, what I, was, I needed. In a certain sense, I didn't know that I needed Buddhism. That is Buddhism. But Buddhism isn't a subject or a theory or an, a, much less an ideology. It's, it's a vision of life and a path of practice. You know. And I think Bhante has made that vision and path and response to life very, very clear uh, in a new context, in a modern context, in which I could devote myself to it. Um, so I think what he gives people is, if you want to practice the Buddha's teaching, the Buddha Dharma, he's created... I, I've been think, thinking recently what you need is... Because um, I've been doing this nature of mind. I'll, I will get around to the question. I've been doing this nature of mind... Um, program, whatever it's called. And, uh, you know, I've been interviewing in, in conversation with people like Ian McGilchrist, who I think is one of the, the major thinkers of the moment, actually. Um, Bernardo Castro, who's a non-materialist uh, philosopher. Uh, all sorts of people, all of whom I've been very impressed with. One of the things that struck me about them, nearly all of them, is that they don't offer a path. They offer a vision, and actually a very, in some cases, a very, very well-articulated vision but they don't offer a path. So what I think we need, and I think what Bhante has given me and what I think he can give you, is um, a vision, a path, and a community. Um, I think that's what he's mostly done in his life, is articulate a vision, a human vision, a vision that's transcendent and even transcendental without being to do with divinity, as I grew up to understand it. Um, a path, a pragmatic path, that you and I can actually follow uh, here and now in the modern, in modern London, um, not in a cave in Tibet, not in an ashram in India, not in a, you know, he's given us a path and he's given us, uh, and he's created a community. I think that is one of the greatest creations. Mm -hmm. It's very striking, you know, interviewing these people who are very, very impressive uh, and much more um, intelligent than me. And what strikes me is that there isn't a path and there's not a community. Um, there needs, and the community, of course, needs a place, doesn't it? It needs a place where a community gathers. Um, I think place is very important to community. And a place and a community need um, a sort of divine central focus, which is what we've got in the Buddha. And I think Bhante has understood that very, very deeply and translated it to a new world that you need a vision of life, um, one that goes beyond, goes beyond all of your identifications. You know, like when I came here, I was struggling coming out and all that sort of thing. And, you know, that, that, was, that was a sort of nightmare for me. But what I, I, I didn't need a vision of coming out. I needed a vision beyond being gay or straight or black or white or anything. I needed a transcendent vision that transcended any difference. I didn't want to be gay as a sort of profession. <laughs> it doesn't pay very well. Like having, being, having curly hair as a profession or something. Um, I, I think all of us need a transcendent vision that goes beyond difference. Otherwise we're in a nightmare and one of the fears of the modern world is we're separating and uh, not forgiving ourselves you know, more and more. So I, I do think... Bante has really articulated a human vision uh, in a new way. And, and I think his, his articulation of that is 
prescient. Even now I go back to lectures that he gave or things he said years and years and years ago, long before I was born. They seem weirdly prescient, yeah. um, like he's talking to now. Mm. Uh, he's got that kind of depth of vision, I think. It's, and it's not, like some people think of Bhante as a scholar, he's not a scholar, he's not a Buddhist scholar, he's not a philosopher, he's not a saint. Mm. Um, he always wanted to be regarded as a friend primarily, even more so than a teacher. Um, because a friend is someone that's aware of you and aware of what, how to try, wants to try and help you. Yeah? So I think he's really articulated that vision and he's created a, a pragmatic path that you can follow, that I can follow if you want to. You don't have to, obviously, but if you want to. And he's created this community, an international community, around that vision. Um, now, I think without a community, I, I really don't... I don't know what we're doing. You know, without an us doing it, you know, you, you, you don't need to come to the Buddhist. If, if you're interested in Buddhism, just go online. You know, there's probably much better stuff on YouTube as we speak. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> All people leave now. Really? <laughs> Elvis is very good. Um, <laughs> um, you know, if you, if you want sort of Buddhist teachings in the simple sense of information, there's, it's much easier to get it online, but I don't think you grow through that. You need a community to grow in. That's a very problematic thing, I think, but you need a, you need a vision, you need a path, um, a coherent path, not just a, um, I want a bit of this and a bit of that, which is more and more a contemporary sort of instinct, is I just want this bit that suits me, that bit that suits me. That doesn't work. I wish it would, but it doesn't. Mm. And you need a community who are travelling that path with you, and that means a place. And, you know, even outside of Bante's writing, what he's done is create those three, three things. And I, for me, that's been of rem- a tremendous importance. For some of you, I hope it could be as well. Um, it doesn't have to be, but it could be, yeah. And, and those things that were right there from the start, which are of yeah. his teaching, of yeah, his yeah. arriving in England. I mean, yeah. I don't... Perhaps now is a good time to say something about that of him creating a new Buddhist movement because that's particular about Tree yes. Ratna, isn't yes, it? Yes, it's a new Buddhist movement. It's fifty years, well, fifty years old, isn't it? Fifty-four years old. Thank you. <laughs> it's not very long, is it? You know, you think of I don't know uh, the Franciscans or something or some other order. It's not very long, fifty-four years. Uh, it's really this whole what we're sitting in now is really in its infancy. We've hardly started in terms of a Buddhist tradition. But it is important to remember it is a new Buddhist tradition. And therefore that implies a critique, even a criticism. Um, Bounty himself said, said, look, if you, if you don't realise I've made a criticism, then it just feels like I just started a Buddhist movement for egotistical reasons. Um, you know, I just sort of fancied doing it one day. I thought, what should I do? could watch Netflix, or I could start a new Buddhist movement. Um, you know, actually the reason he started a new Buddhist movement was that he was very critical of Buddhism. Um, critical of Buddhism not only in the West, wherever that is now, but you know, when he came back to London in, in, the, in the 60s and 70s. Critical of what he saw here, which was very, very nascent, uh, very early days of Buddhism in, in England, but also very critical of Buddhism as it had come down to many, many practitioners in, in the East. Um, so this movement has actually grown out of a criticism. Mm. One of the criticisms being the tendency, I mean, I'm not a Buddhist scholar or anything remotely, but the tendency as, as Buddhism developed for two and a half thousand years to bifurcate into a laity and uh, particularly monks nuns in some traditions, but not all, not in the Tibetan tradition, for instance. Um, he, he saw that as a, a major problem within Buddhism, that, that tendency to bifurcate into a laity on one side and the monks on the other. And then that what came to be, the monks were the real practitioners, mostly monks. There were nuns as well, but mostly monks. Um, and the laity, increasingly as tradition went forward, the, the laity were imagined as people who supported the monks to do the Buddhist thing. Yeah? That, that, that's a very deep theme within Buddhist tradition. And um, 
Banty was very, very critical of it and became more and more critical of it, if anything. He, he himself was ordained as a monk and was lived for many years as a monk. But I remember this lovely story of uh, Astrajit, another friend of mine, and he, he first met Banty when he was teaching meditation in a basement shop in Soho. Um, that's where it all started, a little basement shop of an antique shop in Soho. And it's not Soho as it is now, it's Soho there, which is very, very rough and you know, ready. You know. He was just teaching in this little basement. And he was wearing his yellow robes, and he had long hair, which you shouldn't do in, if to wear a robe, and long, you know, mutton chop sideboards, and then lots of rings, and terribly bad teeth, but that's another matter. Um, <laughs> he'd been in India for a long time. Um, and Asaji was saying, what are you? You know, you, you're wearing this sort of robes of monk, but you've also got, you know, this shirt and this long hair, you know, what are you? And um, Bhante just said, I'm, I'm a full-time Buddhist. Hmm. That's what I am. I'm a, f- I'm, I'm a full-time Buddhist. And that's really his vision of ordination. He wanted, can, how do you be a full-time Buddhist without this confusion of the monks who are supposed to be doing the real thing? And you can imagine how easily that degenerates, especially if someone's cooking for you all the time. <laughs> you know, you, you just end up, if you, it's built into that system, you end up just sort of looking religious but not being. That's not true for all monks by any means and um, not true of Bhante's teachers. Bhante was very aware of great Buddhist teachers but he's also aware of problems within the tradition itself and those teachers were as well. So that's one of the areas of criticism. There are others um, but that's one of them. So he's created, he created a new kind of ordination which in his mind goes ab- is above and beyond laity or monk. It's not, some people think it's like somewhere in the middle or possibly even laity but his vision of ordination is above and beyond that actually the, the, the most important thing was your commitment to the Buddhist path and your commitment to the truth and your commitment to a vision of practice and, and your lifestyle was secondary but not, import, un, not unimportant but it wasn't that what had happened in the Buddhist tradition is lifestyle had become primary that being a monk meant you were a full-time Buddhist which of course it didn't um, but that, that's what had happened. He was trying to reassert that it's your commitment to a, a life of value and vision that's important, especially Buddhist vision. So why, maybe he could say, why do we need ordination at all then, when any of us could decide in a way that that's what we wanted to be as a full-time Yes, yes that's a very good question. I, I sometimes <laughs> wondered. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a funny old thing, ordination. <laughs> um, that the, 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 I think it, it's, it's, it's the most valuable thing I've ever done in my life, become ordained. I was ordained by Suvadra, who was ordained by Bhante. Um, w- without doubt, the most, the most crucial moment of my life. Um, and you see how it sort of also creates issues. <laughs> if you're not careful, you can think of ordination as a promotion or as something you want, like a goal that you want, um, something that will give you something that makes you feel better, accepted, uh, loved by the group. Those, actually, those are all rather problematic instincts, and we've all got them. We all want to feel loved by a group, really, and loved by teachers, and if you're not careful, you start appeasing teachers and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are a definite sort of problems with the idea of ordination. Um, and I've experienced them on both sides. I've experienced problems of not being ordained and wanting to get ordained for sometimes rather wonky reasons. But I've also experienced being related to in an odd way because I'm ordained. Yeah. Um, sometimes not in a very pleasant way, um, sorry, even rude way. Um, so at times I felt very unsure about the value of ordination, to be honest. Um, but then I go back to my own ordination and I go back to the ordinations of my friends. And what I see is a kind of sacred change. Mm-hmm. Um, I think what ordination does, if you want to be ordained, <laughs> I think. If somebody asked me recently, what would you, my advice be if they were thinking about ordination? And my advice was, hesitate. <laughs> 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 and that is still my advice, you know, because um, it's very, very serious. You shouldn't commit yourself to something like ordination without being very, very serious about it. You should hesitate about that. But I've really seen people 
hesitate about it, but if they decide they want to, and if they are true to that, and you can never be fully true to it because you never quite know yourself and what all your motivations are, but if you can be true to that vision, ordination has this, well, the, the traditional word is abhisheka, um, uh, which is, is like, it's, well, it's, it's sometimes called an empowerment, which language that Banty never liked. Mm. Um, but I remember talking to him, and he said, we started saying, well, ordination, you're being witnessed as going for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. That was the language we tend to use, that when you're ordained, your wish to focus on the ideal of enlightenment, to practice in the community of fellow practitioners and to tread the path is witnessed by your private preceptor who's doing it more than you are. You know, That's the traditional language. Bounty, I remember he came for supper and he said, I don't think that's enough, I don't think that's strong enough. He said it's more like a, um, more like a blessing or more like um, something is ignited in you. Um, it's, it's not merely yes, you are doing it, and, and I can tell you that you're doing it. It's more, it's, it's strangely, mystically even, more than that. Um, something in you is seen and, and ignited. Um, and because of that, it's quite risky, I think. Because the instinct is, you know, as soon as you have something you can get, even one of these white cases, you can start to sort of do things to try and get that. And all of that comes back and haunts you if, if you've done that. Yeah. You'd almost certainly done a bit of it. Um, so what, what ordination does, I think, is it amplifies your life. That's my experience. So if you do things that aren't very good, it amplifies that in, for you and for other people. And you can do much more good. It amplifies that. You know, I can sit here and talk in front of people. You know, it sort of amplifies the good if, uh, at best. But it will also amplify what's in the way of the good. That's why I say people should hesitate because it will confront you with whatever doesn't want to, isn't purely going for refuge. And you know, so much of us, myself included, isn't purely practicing a Buddhist path. Um, so I, I, th I think it's a sort of, it's our holy of holies. Um, I, I can see masses of problems with it, but not enough to think it's not the best thing ever to do. Mm. But I do really think it's very, very serious. We're not used to taking... I mean, you are effectively taking vows when you get ordained. Mm -hmm. um, and bounty means them with huge seriousness. You couldn't have a, something more serious, really, than ordination. And it has serious psychic consequences. Like, for me, it had serious psychic consequences. Not all of them pleasant, actually. I mean, some of them pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> like a bit tip thing, a bit too much to the dark side. Yeah, you're not, you're not saying definitely don't. <laughs> yeah, de yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not saying definitely don't, but de definitely don't take... Think. De yeah, no, no, I think it's the best thing to... For me, it was the best thing I've ever done. And I've seen friends absolutely flourish from ordination. Really, sometimes quite miraculously. Yeah. I've seen it go wrong as well. Yeah, yeah. I won't point to anyone. <laughs> 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 joke, just a joke. <laughs> Well, yeah, when it goes wrong, it's, it's painful, and, yeah. and you've done something yeah, and, yeah. Um, that's very You've committed important. yourself to something, and then you don't know, you know, it's, that's risky, you know. Mm. But then life is risky. You can't grow if you don't take risks. Mm. Mm. Um, maybe, yeah, while we're talking about ordination, um, what's the question? Well, as... When we get ordained, we've just uh, this year had a whole batch of new people getting ordained. Um, very nice, uh, uh, recent event to, to yeah. Some of them are in here. Um, very nice, a uh, recent big uh, order event to to see them all sort of lining up and, and welcoming them into the order. But it's an order without its founder now. So yeah. what is the relationship or, with the order and? And its founder, yeah. I mean, some people are wanting to think of Bounty as the founder. And I think that is slightly problematic because it suggests he just started it. And he even sometimes can be like, and it'll get better. Hopefully it will get better. But I, I think of Bounty more of the genius of, of our movement in the, in the sense of its visionary genius. Um, I was saying about a vision of life. You can't have a, um, you can't come up with that within a committee. 
Um, a, a vision implies a visionary. Um, what what this movement is is a vision of life, a vision of a path, and a vision of a community. All of that starts with Bante, I think. Um, you 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 can't decide what a vision is. It has to, a vision. The metaphor of vision is is something direct. It's something in a way personal. Um, it's not something that's a theory that's read off things. It's not that Bante read lots of Buddhist books and sort of came up with a, sort of a new Buddhist tradition that kind of did stuff. Um, actually, it comes very, very directly from a vision he had, mm. um, both in the literal sense of visions he had and in the metaphorical sense of a, a sense of what was needed, a sense, a living sense of what Buddhism was. Buddhism isn't a theory, it's not an... It's not a philosophy, it's not a religion, it's not, you name it, it's not. It's not even, it's not an ism, that's why there's, you know, yeah, that's it's problematic. Not even it's not even Buddhism. It's, it's a, it's a, uh, you know, it's a vision. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that was, anyway, um, it, <laughs> I'm promising my friends upstairs not to make jokes. Um, it's a vision, isn't it? And you can't have a vision without a visionary. You, you can't get a vision. You have to be gifted with a vision. And he, I think, has given us a vision. Now, I think up to asking for ordination, you may or may not have feel much of a connection with Bante. Um, and some people inside the order and outside it are critical of Bante, and there are things to be critical of. Um, but when you ask for, if, you, if, having hesitated, you ask for ordination, you are actually coming into a relationship with him. Um, there's no such thing as a generic Buddhist ordination. You know, you're, you're always ordained within a particular tradition. It could be this tradition, it could be Thich Nhat Hanh's tradition, another new Buddhist movement. Mm-hmm. It could be um, in a, one of the many Tibetan traditions, it could be in a, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a Thai tradition. There's lots of traditions, all of which you can still get, many of which you can still be ordained in. And there, a tradition is a, a coherent vision, hopefully, and a coherent path and a coherent community. Actually, our path and community is actually very, very broad. If you went to some other Buddhist traditions, it's much stricter than we are. Uh, people think that we're strict. We're not at all. We're actually very, very floppy. Um, <laughs> you know, a lot, a lot of Buddhist traditions, for instance, they, won't, they tell you what to read, for instance. You read this and not that. And you read these in that order. Um, and, you know, you wouldn't get to know the teacher, for instance, in lots of Buddhist traditions. You'd, you'd never have a cup of coffee with the teacher. The teacher would be wheeled on and wheeled off again. Um, so each... And there's values in... Not necessarily wheeled. Uh, but come on and go off. Um, and there's actually a value in all that. But it's a different vision. Yeah. So um, there isn't a generic thing called Buddhism which you could get ordained into. There is particular Buddhist traditions that have been started by particular people from their vision of what Buddhism is. Because Buddhism isn't primarily words on a piece of paper. It's not primarily a a system of thought. It's not a a religious belief. Um, It's it's something visionary in that deepest sense of an instinct for the highest value in life and how Buddhism articulates that. Um, So what that means is that to make progress, you need, to, uh, after a certain point, and for our, in our system, that point is, I think, is asking for ordination particularly, although it's got points before that. At asking for ordination, you, you voluntarily, because you want to go deeper, go narrower. The, the instinct is that we should go broader. Actually, to go deeper into anything, you have to go narrower. You have to choose a particular tradition. It's like a musician, if you play the sax and the trumpet and the piano, if you want to be a master at one of those things, or a, you know, a great pianist or a great sax player, you have to choose one. You have to narrow. You have to actually go very narrow to go very deep. You know, to be a great sax player, you have to give your life to the sax, not to the flute, not to the clarinet, not things near it. Yeah? And that's even more true of a, Buddhist, of, a, of, a, of a spiritual, want of a better word, tradition. And that the Zen metaphor of it is that if you go to a well, what you need to do is, is put your bucket all the way down to the bottom of the well and get the water up. Yeah? It's no good going to lots of wells and putting your bucket halfway down. Yeah? 
So in a, in a certain sense, if you want to commit yourself to Buddhism, you need to at some point think, which well am I going to put my bucket all the way down to? Otherwise you won't get anywhere. It's very tempting to go try this, try that, and that's fine for a while, even quite a good while. I, I didn't do that myself, but I know friends who have. But if you really want to go deep in life, never mind Buddhism and never mind anything, you need to narrow, don't you? You need to, you know, like, if you want to be a mother, you, you need to have these children, which those, you know, yeah. you can't just go, okay, let's go. <laughs> They sort of get a collection, you know, <laughs> vaguely children people, you know, and sort of be a mother to them. You know, it, it has to be these particular children, you know, I've got that in my own life to some degree. And ev everything to go deeper has to, as it were, go narrow. It's just that our modern mindset is that we should go broad. You know? Narrow in the right sense, of course. I don't mean sectarian, but, you know, concentrated is probably better. Has that answered your question? I, I was trying to remember what the question yes, was. <laughs> was. What is our relationship to him? Oh, yes, that's right. No, it hasn't answered your question. Um, <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's got some, some way. I think you, you, as an order member, you are in, whether you like it or not, a very, very close relationship with Bhante because you've taken his ordination. Mm. You've not taken generic Buddhist ordination. You've not taken... You, you've, you've entered into his vision of the Buddha Dharma. You won't, it's, if you don't know that, it's because you don't know Buddhist traditions very well. You don't know how different they are. Yeah? So whether you know it or not, you're in a very, very close relationship with him. So your, any concerns you have about him, any problems you have around him will show up very, very strongly. And, you know, they, they need to be discussed and explored and so on. But they'll show up very strongly. Mm -hmm. But you have taken his ordination. If you don't want to do that, then I would suggest not. You know, there are lots of other ordinations you can take, or non-ordination people. Yeah. More and more people are sort of imagining themselves as being non-aligned Buddhists, yeah. which is, I think, foreign to the whole spirit of Buddhism, but it's, it's more and more common now. Mm -hmm. and I, I was just, um, see if I can articulate this as well, um, there's a tendency nowadays to um, give everybody what everybody thinks they want. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. obviously, when you were talking about uh, Bante's vision, Another thing that it's not is a, um, a cert he didn't do a survey of the people around him and say, what, what do you want? No, no. Um, and I'll try and help you do that. No, and, no, no. and I think that that's what sometimes people expect. Yes, um, that's yeah. what we're, anytime you do anything online, there's a survey to fill in about <laughs> yes, right. how, how it was clicking on that box or button or something yeah, yeah. Um, and educational place uh, institutions etc uh, are so so keen to have our approval um, and there's something about retaining the vision of our visionary let's yeah. use that word rather yeah. than the founder yeah. and and living to that rather than sort of saying oh how can we make yes that's, how that's a very we, good point um, I choose it, the bits of what Banty said to fit yes. what people like. Yes, that's right. You, <laughs> if we're not careful, we'll just sort of edit all sorts of bits of Banty out that we just don't like, uh, which is, is, is kind of uh, intellectually problematic. Um, but uh, another way of saying that is that any, any religious tradition, or whatever this tradition is, and, and I, I prefer religious and spiritual, because spiritual sounds so flaky, mm. is it's a discipline. And again, I think if you're going to grow... It's not just that you need a path, a, what do you say, a vision, a path and a place. You need a discipline. I mean, the Buddha tends to talk about my... He didn't talk about Buddhism. He talked about my dharma and discipline. Um, and I think a discipline has got to be pushing back on you, uh, which means not always giving you what you want. You know, that if you want to put on muscle, you have to lift weights, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't actually done it. Um, I think some of them are very heavy. Anyway, um, you know, if you want to get hench, which is a word I've only just discovered, um, you, you need to lift weights. You know, you, just, you don't want to go in there and say, OK, how do you feel? Oh, do you feel a bit tired? Well, we weren't doing anything. You know, um, if you want to get larger, uh, you need to lift weights. You need a discipline, you know. If you want to, if you want to have a much better, you know, health, and so you need discipline. It's a, it's a very rude word in contemporary life because we, we want to get rid of discipline, but it's not doing us any favours. Of course, 
th there's quite an art in how you work with discipline because you can overdo it but you, and you can massively underdo it but what we what 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 you got in a tradition any tradition is a discipline this is how this is a this is a form that you're going to take up you know so for instance one of parts of Bante's discipline is um, solitary retreats you know um, friend Stephen Manis has just gone today on a three-month solitary retreat Jan of Archer recently was on a six-month solitary retreat all of my friends are asking me when am I going on a <laughs> anyway but I, anyway two weeks is fine two weeks is fine um, but you know it's something I would never have done yeah. if he if 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 Bante had said that what do you think you need I would never have chosen to go on a solitary retreat. It's just really not me. Um, I'm an extrovert. I don't, you know, even now I go on a solitary retreat and think, hang on, I don't like solitary retreats. <laughs> <laughs> Who made this decision? Um, <laughs> but they've, they've always been incredibly fruitful for me. You know, so that, that was a, it, one, one example. Another example, you know, when, when I was ordained, we, I was on a four-month retreat. I'm not sure I would have chosen that. Um, there's so many parts of... Well, we, for instance, we've got, um, we, we value events um, in, in single-sex groupings, which most people nowadays just find really weird. But I've really benefited from that. So what, what you've got in any discipline is something that pushes back on you, that doesn't actually just do what you want. I, I think actually that's very important. I think it's like, um, I think it's like the effect of form in poetry. Um, Poetry is one of my little obsessions, but we've all got one, haven't we? <laughs> um, but the first time I wrote a sonnet, when there's a friend of my, my, my poetry mentor, she said, I think this is a sonnet. You know, I had to look it up. You know, what was a sonnet? Mm -hmm. But a sonnet, has, has a, it's, it's a 14 lines. It, after eight lines, you need to do um, um, the volta, where it needs to be a change. It, it, it has a certain sort of rhyme scheme. When you, when you choose the right form... It, what it does then, that sonnet form, to use that, to use that metaphor, is it pushes against you. You can't say what you like, because you've got, you got A, B, A rhyme, say, for instance. So you've got to get to that rhyme. You know, if you said cat, at some point you need to get to mat. Don't do that. Don't <laughs> um, in other words, it, you can't just say what you like. Yeah? Yeah. And what that does is it does the reverse of what you think it's going to do. You think it's going to cramp you. What it does when it works, when you've got the right form is it enables you to say things that you didn't know you had. It's miraculous. You know, if you, can, if you get the right form, and you can get the wrong form as well, but if you get the right form, you say something that you couldn't say. You say something that's deeper, more resonant, more memorable, more universal, more beautiful than you could say. And that's terribly exciting. That's what you wanted. If you just wrote it in free verse, where you just get to break the lines when you fancy... They're nearly always quite floppy. Um, and I, so I think what Banty's done is given us a form like that that resists you, where you can't just do what you want, because that will bring the best out of you, mm. at best, if you've got the right form and if that's, if that's what you're, you're kind of inspired by. I think what Tree Ratner is, is a form, like the Sestina form or the sonnet form, that um, if you engage with it strongly enough, will bring out things in you that you didn't know you had. For instance, our form, for instance, often brings out in people, they didn't, you know, that lots of people want to be spiritual nowadays. And sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes that's actually a nightmare, but um, sometimes it's a good thing. But what our form does is, it, because we emphasise friendship so much, and that comes from Bante, it doesn't come from other Buddhist traditions, it comes from Bante's vision. And friendship in Bante's vision is something quite vigorous, he said it's more like a cold bath than a warm shower. Actually, a bit more warm shower sometimes would be a good thing. But, you know, in other words, it's, uh, he, he thinks of friendship as being something quite vigorous and um, whether you can be uh, empathic, yes, but also critical. Yeah. And I think for many people what that does is it shows up areas of their life that they don't want to look at. You know, and I, if that's done that for me, but I remember it very strongly when I first came along particularly, it, you know, for revealed to me how much I wanted to identify with being a victim. It, it revealed to me how much anger I, I had myself, which I had, in a way, projected onto my brothers, out of our form. It sort of pushed me into areas that I wouldn't have chosen to go. Um, you know, I, I, I went on, I remember my first single-sex retreat, and I just thought, this is just completely weird. 
but there was something in that that I really needed to learn about, in my case, being a man. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think part of our for, for what a form does is it pushes back on you and asks for more of you. And that can, at times can be uncomfortable, like it is if you try and write a sonnet. But it can actually be remarkable. Like you come up with things. You know, I'm seeing Surinaga there. I'm so seeing Surinaga being ordained. And you just see him uh, flourish. Um, you know, like the form brings out a new thing that you couldn't have done. Um, so Mount of Adra has just been ordained. And you, you see the same with him. It doesn't always happen like that. But it, it's it, a bit like a sonnet doesn't always come off, you know, it's only it could just rhyme and be a bit boring. Mm. But what we have is a form that is a vision of life that can bring more out of you than you knew you had, including the darkest, as it were, darker sides of yourself. Do we, do we always have to stick to the same form? Form. Okay. Well, Banty said How that you can evolve? change everything apart from the going for issues. The trouble with that is that okay. everything comes back to that and so you can't change anything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but... What, what you want is, 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 again, just to follow that metaphor, you ca- you, it, it, is, it evolves, but it, um, it's very difficult to say, because what we think is, oh, oh, we must be able to choose what we want to do. Not, you know, we can break the form, so mm. forth. And there is a way of breaking form that is part of form, and a way of breaking form that isn't. So one of my favourite poets is the American poet Elizabeth Bishop, and she wrote a villanelle, which is another set form called One Art, and she breaks the form in various ways, and she sort of weirdly sticks to it. She breaks it in a way that evolves the form. Do you see what I mean? The form is still there of the villanelle. I won't bore you with what that form is. It's very difficult. And she breaks the form of it, the strictness of it, in a way that actually evolves the villanelle. Mm. So you think, oh, the villanelle can now do more than I realise. I don't have to be stuck in this. That's true. That's very. That's a good metaphor for us. Yes. We can keep breaking the form in the sense of evolving it. Yes. Um, we've got a vision. We've got a community and a path. And yes, we need to keep on breaking that form. Like, for instance, one of the things that we really are massively behind with is the dead, dreadful word marketing. You know, we Bant is not very doesn't doesn't think in those sort of ways. So we haven't communicated ourselves. I don't think yet very well online. I think there's a long way to go. Um, Bandy didn't teach that. He wasn't interested in that. Mm. He, for instance, he wasn't particularly struck by science. He thought that was his great weakness as a teacher, is that he, didn't partic- he wasn't particularly inspired by science. Yes, yeah, so he's he want- sometimes a bit dismissive of even, the scientific yeah, outlook. He doesn't yes. quite like it very, very often, um, and very critical of scientism, at least. Um, and he said, look, I don't want you to follow me in that way. So you, breaking the form is actually part of the value of form. What can I do with it that, that is honourable to the form, but not slavish to it? Yes. And, and that's exactly the same with us. How can I animate this form, bring out its beauty? We're not trying to create a sort of heritage site, a Sangharachita heritage site, where we just say the things that Bante says. Um, that, that, that's just a dead. That's just dead. Yeah. It's just like trying to write a Victorian sonnet now or something like that. We need to keep on creating the form, but it needs to be evolve out of the form, not just be a kind of something else. Yeah. That, 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 that's and um, it's keeping the vision clear. Yes, that's right. That's, that's the purpose of all of the form is to reach the vision. To reach, to the, reach vision. the vision, or to and to keep to going back to, to that vision. vision. Yeah. And that vision can never be adequately explained or or um written about you, you we've hardly even tried to yes <laughs> you can never you have to just keep saying the word vision so so yeah. often and never, what's he talking about you know you have to get it yeah. like you get the beauty of a landscape or the beauty of a picture if someone said what do you mean you think well just look at it we're nearly at the end i just wondered if we could take one or two yeah, be nice. questions yeah. um there must be one or two questions in the crowd. There we go. Sophie. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. A, a practical question. Can we hear any of Fante's talks like online anywhere? Yeah, there's a website called Free Buddhist Audio and the whole archive of his talks, if you write Sangharakshita in the search box. Yeah. 
got a very distinctive voice. You know, there's lots of them on there. And you know, there's a, a, a sangratchers.org. Um, so I'm mm-hmm. looking at Sonog because he's making it. Oh. So it's a very, very good site, I'd recommend. Yeah, you'll learn lots more about his life as well as have access yeah. to all his archive. And there's another question there at the back. Yeah. yeah. Do you think he was quite lonely? Do I think he was quite lonely? Yeah. Huh. You know, sort of um, peerless in a way. Oh, I see what you mean, yeah. Um, he certainly said he had times where he felt very alone. I don't think he... he I can't remember him ever saying that he felt lonely, but he certainly said he, he felt at times very alone. Um, I remember a, a story I told by an old member where, you know, everyone was just messing about and Banty was just very frustrated. And somebody said to him, how do you deal with all of us? And he just said, well, I'm not a naturally patient person. <laughs> 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 he sort of had to be patient. So I think there was, when you look at, when you read his memoirs, you know, huge memoirs, one of the things, I remember this quite late in his life, I said to him what, was, what had struck me reading, rereading them was how alone he was for many, many years with a vision that nobody really shared and actually criticised him for. And he, and he just said, yes, indeed, I was. I was very, very alone. Um, but I don't think he would have thought of himself as lonely. He, he always had at least one good friend, but he, he would, there were large, long periods of his life where he was very, very alone existentially alone, alone as a person, alone as a thinker, alone amongst fellow Buddhists. You know. So yeah, that, that, that's true. And so I think some of his poetry, he was a prolific poet as well, uh, sort of reflects a, a longing for someone who is a sort of match for him yeah. in some yes, ways. He does, yeah. Yeah. It's very difficult to match him, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I could laugh at his jokes, but I couldn't. I remember trying to have a talk with him about Schopenhauer at one point, and back about whom I had actually read one book. But, you know, he said, well, do you mean Schopenhauer? And he said, well, actually, forget it, you know. <laughs> Let's get back to jokes, you know. <laughs> um, I mean, he is like, Bantu, I, keep, see, I, I still can't quite do the past participle. In my mind, he still is, not was. And I, I, think, I think that's right. It feels right to me. I, he's a, he is um, a sort of, he is a kind of genius. I mean, remarkable genius, you know. It, 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 by any estimation, whether you like him or agree with him or not, he's quite clearly a sort of genius. Um, but he is also a presence. You know, that I, I do find it interesting that I can't quite settle to was or is. If I use is, I think that's, no, no, he has, he's been dead for four years. Mm-hmm. But I can't quite settle for was either. Mm-hmm. Neither feel quite true to me. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't think it's me being fanciful. Um, I dreamt about him again, for instance, the other night, which I don't do so much as I used to. I used to dream about him a lot, but he is a presence here. He's a presence in us, in you and I. He's a, he's a presence in this room. He opened this centre. Yeah. And it, I don't mean that just in a sort of notional sense. I think we don't know... One of the things we were doing with nature of mind is trying to realise that we don't know the nature of mind. That perhaps mind isn't... I mean, more and more philosophers are saying that mind is not a product of brain. You know, the, the mind is not an epiphenomena of the brain. It, more and more, Ian, Ian McGilchrist um, and others like uh, Bernardo Castro were saying that um, what Buddhism is saying, which is that mind precedes the world, that, um, that consciousness is all about us and that mind is more like a limiter valve. More and more people, you know, in all walks of life, from people who have near-death experiences and so on, so, we don't actually know what it means when someone dies. Um, you know, our, our assumption is that when the brain dies, that the, the consciousness is snuffed out. But that's more and more problematic, philosophically problematic. Um, so, I don't see why we need to think him of was or is. He seems to me to be a presence, and it's a presence that you can uh, tune into, just like you can tune into so many presences. And people at Adistana, where he's buried, do people who aren't even invested in him as a teacher actually just uh, do have quite strong yeah. encounters with his palpable presence. Yeah, even with Bhante talking to them in his meditation, people yeah. who don't never heard of him. Um, in dreams and yeah. things like that. Um, let's have one more question, and then we'll we'll finish. Uh, let's have one. yeah. Um, so I think I've heard um, people talk previously. It might even have been yourself about. Um, 
part of Bante's vision, maybe vision is not the right term here, but part of what he felt was important in being Buddhist was the arts and appreciation of the aesthetic and how that allows you to kind of connect with yourself, your experience. Mm. So there's lots of things about his vision that are kind of part of the form of the Tarakna movement, Mm. kind of use the language, you know, solitary retreat and Mm. the way ordination works and um, I guess sort of um, friendship to some some degree is almost sort of baked in. Do you think that 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 side of what he felt to be important, the, the kind of expression and aesthetic and the arts and all that kind of thing is central to his vision for the purposes of the tradition and how do you, how do you think we, if that is the case, how do we keep that alive? Mm, it's a very good question. Um, I, I sort of do and I don't mm. think it's central. I think the problem with the language of the arts is the word arts, mm. so it all sounds so so middle class, and <laughs> you sort of want to speak a bit nicer, don't you? As soon as you mention the arts, <laughs> wants to have that sort of timber to it. Um, <laughs> um, uh, particularly in England, it, it, the arts in England have got very associated with class. It's not like that so much in Ireland. It's not like that in Russia. You know, if you're an Italian, you'll you'll be you'll have been going to see Verdi's operas since you know. It, but it, for the English, it's very it's very it's got very mixed up with class. And so some people have felt that, well, this is just, um, you know, somehow expression of Bantu's class um, affiliation. Actually, his work, thoroughly working class Bantu, comes from a, a, a thoroughly work, his father was a, a furniture polisher, his mother, you know, you know very, very, very ordinary working class background um, in the South London black background. So on one hand, I think, you know, I think of someone like Dada Rinpoche, who was one of Bante's teachers, Tibetan teachers, he probably never ex- experience of what we would call sort of the high arts, you know, whatever that means now. Um, and he, Bhante said he was a living bodhisattva. So that suggests that you don't actually need the arts, actually. Um, you know, because being a living bodhisattva, which is sort of like a saint, a uh, Buddhist saint, you, you, you know, you clearly don't need the arts for that. Um, I think he's, Bhante's trying to say something deeper. He's trying to say, you need pleasure in your life. You really need pleasure in your life. A life without pleasure is unlivable. But if you don't, and if you don't educate yourself in pleasure, you'll tend to get, go for low pleasures, easy pleasures, sex. Um, try to think of something else. That's quite a good joke, though. Cinema. <laughs> I went to see Elvis last you know, um, you know, you'll tend to you know, food, so, you know, sort of, human beings need a life with a lot of pleasure in them. Um, he's trying to say, okay, well, let's, it, are there pleasures that we can have, and this is thoroughly Buddhist, that are bound up with craving? Um, because craving, hankering, yearning, actually creates suffering. This is one of the central Buddhist insights of the Buddha, is that it, there could be pleasures that aren't linked with craving. And, you know, in, in the tradition, that's, you know, deep meditation and so on. I think it's also that's the root of Dante's thought about the arts, is there are possibilities of having pleasure, even rapturous pleasure, that aren't linked to craving and therefore to uh, the narcotics of craving. You know, addiction is the great matter, isn't it, with pleasure? You, it's so easily, pleasure is intrinsically addictive, whether you're addicted to sugar or um, coffee or cocaine um, or sex, you know, they... It, it, pleasure easily becomes addictive, but you can't live without it. So he's trying to find a way in which you can live a thoroughly Buddhist life and have pleasure. And the arts have been one of the great ways of doing that, as long as one understands why one is doing it, not just to start to have that accent. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with people with that accent, but you know, not not to try and sort of not for a sort of um, to, to sort of improve your social profile, but to have deeper pleasures. Um, I think that's very, very important indeed. But I think it goes a bit more even. I think to have a vision is an aesthetic matter. In fact, most of the a- issues in life are primarily, it seems to me, aesthetic. Um, the way you judge whether someone's telling the truth, uh, if someone's trustworthy, the way you judge whether you can be a friend of this person, they're kind of aesthetic judgments. Um, one of the things that I've been hearing, I don't know whether it's true, that more and more young people are are no longer able to read people's faces 
because they're mo- it's more and more you know, teenagers are mostly through phones. So that, that you're losing the ability to read the face. That's very, very dangerous because you can then meet someone who's perfectly charming and says lovely things, but you don't have an instinct for how they are, who they are. And that's an aesthetic instinct. Um, the, 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 the sense that, you know, that experience I had of listening to Bante giving that talk, it was a kind of aesthetic experience, a rapturous aesthetic experience. It wasn't a visual one, but it was a... Because truth and beauty are linked very, very deeply. Even in mathematics, things are more likely to be true if they're beautiful. In philosophy, uh, what, what, what philosophers are trying to do is come to the most beautiful economic answer, not the most complex and, and convoluted. You know, um, the be- all the, those old-fashioned things of beauty, truth and goodness, that they are bound together and you need to be cultivating all of them. Um, that doesn't mean to say being arty, but I think, yeah, one other thing I'd say is I, I, what I feel, and perhaps I'm going to finish now, but what I feel is I need to leave the world a lot. Um, I find the world quite often pretty tre- terrible, um, charming though I am. Um, <laughs> that, that's partly my own psychology, but it's also the facts of life. You know, you don't need to look very far, even on the news, or look around you to see an awful lot of ugliness and pain and suffering and, and, and so on. And even outside of that, there's so much duty in life, isn't there? So much of life is frankly boring. Um, <laughs> You know, I've got two teenage girls in my life and everything is boring, but I know what they mean. <laughs> um, you need to leave it, don't you? You need to leave your responsibilities, you need to leave your duties, you need to leave the boring tedium of e- emails that you need to do. You need to disappear and dream. And I think that's what the arts are trying to do. They're trying to get you to leave the world by looking at a painting or listening to a symphony or watching a dance or, you know, whatever, so that you come back in better shape. Rather than leave the world and just sort of, you know, scroll through your Instagram posts, where you come back feeling even more um, sort of thin and toxic than you were before. But that instinct that we've all got, you know, to look at dog videos on... <laughs> we've all got it? Anyway, uh, you know, on Instagram, it's because you need to leave the world. You do. I need to. You, do, you need to leave it pretty often, I think. Mm. At least every day you need to get away. Be and enchanted or something. Be enchanted and then come back feeling better for it. Yeah. And I think that's at best what the arts are trying to do. And that's why Banty is emphasising so much. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, my chair, Banty. So much more we could explore. Um, mm. We could do a series, but we're not. We're doing a series on who was the Buddha. Uh, so going even further back in time. So do come for that next week. But let's, in the meantime, uh, say thank you very much to my chair, Banty. <laughs> tonight um so let's in in the same way that we left the shrine room um i think to put the cushions away i think some of us are just going to have to leave without doing any uh, a tidying up so perhaps this this side could leave first and um, everything will be all right somehow